right, so you all are, are turning in homework three today. Um, if you haven't already done so, please bring that up here. Uh, I am in the process of distributing those um, to make sure I don't miss any and whatnot. Um, so hopefully today you have come prepared with questions for uh, exam one because that's on Wednesday. Um, let me take a second and go through what's going to be on the exam, how it's going to be formatted, and so on and so forth. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you that the solutions to homeworks one, two, and three are on Blackboard. Okay? Um, homework three just got posted. Um, homework two solution, I believe, was on there last Friday. Um, but everything should be up there. And if, I'm going to check one more time before class is over to make sure that everything's up. But everything should be up. All right, let's, let's just talk about the exam. <clears throat> okay, so the exam will be open manual. Okay, you can bring your manual. Uh, it'll be closed notes. So what I mean is you can bring a formula sheet. You can put whatever you want on that formula sheet. Just don't put on worked out examples. Okay? And the reason I say that is because it's really easy to have a problem. Uh, it's, it's really easy to have a problem, like an example problem, on your formula sheet. And there's like a web thickness of 0.393 inches. And suddenly it just sort of shows up on your exam problem. And I'm like, where the heck did this value come from? Because during the exam, you're pulling values from there. And so it's not really for me. It's, it's really for you. Now, the coverage, uh, lecture notes 1 through 4. Now, let me say this, and this is really for the folks that aren't in concrete design. We're going to start on time, and by on time, if everybody is here, we will start at 10.55, okay? If not, we'll wait until 11, but I need everybody in this room, okay? Everybody, all right, and we'll start early. I'll bring the stapler, the scratch paper, all that stuff. You just need to bring yourselves, something to write with, the calculator, and the manual. Sound good? Let's talk about what's on the exam. So fundamentals, I want you to generally be able to generally describe the process of structural engineering, you know, the role of the engineer and the consultant, responsibilities, the bidding process, stuff we talked about like day one, day two. Tell me what the difference is between ASD and LRFD. Um, for loads, I want you to be able to perform basic load takedowns. So that means determine base wind pressures at a given elevation and distribute seismic shears uh, like we have done before. And a basic understanding of gravity loads. That, that, that's really all I want there. Be able to describe the fundamental properties of steel. So the stress strain curve, I don't want you to memorize it, but just make sure that you understand what's going on there. You know, yielding, fracture, all that jazz. Um, tension members, be able to analyze tension members according to the following limit states. Gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear rupture, and slenderness limits. Also, I uh, want you to be able to design economical shapes. Uh, and for those loadings, remember, the most economical to us is the lightest weight. Um, and also be able to design threaded rods. <clears throat> what I did here in the next few slides is I tried to make it a little easier on you. Um, I threw in all of the, the formulas that are relevant to uh, what we've been doing so far. So, uh, for instance, here are, here's everything related to the wind provisions, the formulas. Here's the seismic provisions, all the formulas that we use. Um, here's the load combos, and the ones in red, I think, are the ones that are probably going to affect you most on the exam and on homeworks and whatnot. Material properties, also threw in the stars that I think you should have tabbed in your manual. So some stuff in part one, like the W shapes, the C shapes, the angles, the T's. Um, page 2-48 is where this stuff is, the applicable uh, specs for FY and FU. Um, tension members, so gross section yielding, 0.9 FYHE, net section fracture, 0.75 FU times the net area times U. Uh, your net area for your bolted connections is the gross area minus the area lost due to the presence of bolt holes, plus any necessary stagger factors. Remember the hole diameter is the bolt diameter plus an eighth of an inch. Shear lag factors, um, page 16, 1-30, star that, have that in your manual. Uh, the most common case is case 2, 1 minus the connection eccentricity divided by the connection length. Um, other cases are found in the table. Don't forget L over R is less than or equal to 300. It's R min, 
So that can change depending upon if you're looking at an angle or an arc or a, a T or whatever. Um, also, don't forget units. Remember, length is in feet, R is in inches, so make sure it's unitless. <clears throat> and these are the new formulas. Tension member design, we have our uh, expression for minimum gross area, our expression for the minimum radius of gyration, our formula for efficiency, um, block shear rupture. We have our expression for RN for the nominal capacity. Remember, when this is all said and done, we need to adjust this by our feed value of 0.75. Uh, and then we have our threaded rod design to determine the minimum bar diameter based on a prescribed loading. Sound good? That is everything on exam one. Now what I'm going to do is shut up, at least on, on my, my lecture. I want you all to ask whatever questions you have. Anything that I can do to make life easier for you on the exam. The floor is yours. <coughs> Can you, uh, you say how many questions you're thinking about putting on it? Great question. So um, probably what it'll be is it'll be one set of conceptual questions and three problems. Now I will say that it probably won't be three problem threes on that last homework assignment. That was a big problem and there was a lot of iterations. It's not going to be that. It might be snippets of a given problem. But I'm going to use the same rule that I've used before that if it's an hour long test, I should be able to do it in 20 minutes or less. So that's, that's how I'll make the test. And if it takes me longer than 20 minutes, I'll cut out some stuff in the problem so that you can do it in 20 minutes. But yeah, it'll be, it'll be, I'll go ahead, it will be three computational problems. You may have mentioned this or not, but will these um, formulas be an issue? Should they come with both? Mm -hmm. I, no, you can bring a formula sheet and put whatever you want on there. Yeah. This is me sort of summarizing the stuff that I thought was important, but go through the notes and if there's anything else, put that on your sheet. I'm just putting everything in one place for you. But no, they're not going to be on the exam. Right. Keep in mind, you've got the manual. So here, here's what I would, I would say. You've got a formula sheet, you've got the manual. If you desperately need to look it up, don't put it on your formula sheet. But I don't think there's anything bad with saying, okay, A36 steel, FY is 36, FU is 58. You could save yourself some time from looking that up. What you put on the formula sheet versus what you rely on the manual is up to you. Every, pretty much everything up here is in the main, other than maybe that, and that's just sort of like a creation of mine, you know. Although it's not really even that special, it's just solving for AG. Uh, can you explain when, or go into when we use the Rx value versus the Ry value? That's a good question. It's whenever R -Y, Rx is less than Ry. Um, usually not the case. However, it could be for T's, for WT's. If you're designing a WT, RX can be less than RY. Okay. But um, usually you're not going to use RX. Um, usually you're going to use either RY or RZ if it's an angle. Okay. But yeah, usually not. There's got to be more questions than that. Is the equation sheet front and back? Or just yes. Okay. I have no problem with that. Like I said, I, I don't like worked out problems not for my sake, but for yours. I've had instances where during grading, I'll, I'll let students put whatever, whatever they want in there, and values just show up out of nowhere. And I, I have no idea where this value comes from. And then I'm taking off more points than probably you deserve because I have no idea what you're doing. So um, if you don't have any of those specific examples on your formula sheet, then it what will happen when you're taking the exam is that any of the values that are on the page tend to come from the problem. So it makes it easier for me to grade it, but then 
the, the benefit for you is that because I have a thorough understanding of what you did, it, it helps me take off less points. Like if I know, oh, it's just a calculator error, then it's just minus one point. But if I'm like, I have no idea what you're doing, then I'm like, I have no idea. I'm going to have to take off like five or six points. And I prefer not to do that. So. I should probably pass this one. How are you feeling about the exam? Are you nervous or are you concerned? I mean, if you're nervous or concerned about something, that's what you should be asking about. And I mean, like, don't let anything, don't, don't leave. I don't want anybody to leave here like, man, I wish I asked him about this. Or maybe the flip side is, can I ask him about this? Yes, ask. I mean, if I can't answer, I won't answer. So, um, can you explain how to pick for the eccentricity for the U case two? For U case two, um, is there a specific like type of problem that you're looking at? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Because it, it's easier whenever you're looking at a particular problem. Uh, it was the homework you just passed back with that um, C shape. The C shape. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's the channel. Here's the channel. Okay. And if I remember, that channel had bolts like this, where that, I think that was like four inches, something like that. Um, yeah, I think it three inches. Oh, that was the one that was staggered. Oh, okay, okay. Like there was like something here and something there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, so maybe. Okay, right? Okay, now, this marker's dying on me a bit. Now, what would happen in, let's say, you know, some, some application, like let's say here's your channel, right? So this is one of those flanges sticking out, one of those flanges sticking out, and then you're going to have, I don't know, Something like that. And then likewise over here. <clears throat> the better you visualize it, the easier it is to answer this step, right? And so what would happen from there is this would be connected to some, I don't know, piece out here, to some piece out here. And then, you know, you begin to load on it, right? So, the first thing that you have to do is you have to define what's called the connected face, okay? So, here's my channel. Looking at it like this, there's probably some, I don't know, plate out here that it's connected to, right? So, what I'm saying is, okay, here's the channel, here's the plate coming into contact. I'm saying that this is the connected face. Because that's what's going to come into contact with some plate uh, when I bolt this thing together. Does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that? Now, here's my channel. And if I'm looking at this channel, the next question is where's the centroid? Okay. Now for a channel, the centroid is going to be somewhere like there. So if you have, let's say, a channel, the centroid is going to be somewhere like there. If you've got an angle, Centro is going to be somewhere right there. You know, a T shape. Centro is going to be somewhere right there. So on and so forth. Make sense? And so the question is how far is it from the connected face to the centro? And that dimension is X bar. Okay? Now, if you understand that, 
The only other thing that's confusing, and I don't even want to say it's confusing, it, it's, it's just this. So if you open it up to the C shapes, I want everybody to do this. Let's open it up to the C shapes. C shapes. She sells C shapes down by the C shapes. That was really cheesy. It's okay, you can admit it. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus on the schematic up here. Because I think the first time that you see it, it's like there's a lot going on here. But I want to focus on this because of, of, of what you see. Now, let's see if we can identify some of these dimensions. So I've got the D value, that's the total depth, right? I've got T sub F, that's the flange thickness. Um, let's see, uh, B sub F, you can see that. Okay, does everybody see the X and the Y that sort of look like this? Like, like here's the channel, and you should be able to point something out or pick something out that kind of... It should sort of look like this. Does everybody see that? Okay. That point is the centroid. Okay. Where those two cross, that's the centroid. And so what I'm after is how far is it from that connected face to that centroid. That's the distance I'm after on this schematic. And if you look at the diagram, you can see on the top how that's x bar. Do you see that? That's that's what you're after. Okay. So it's a long answer, but it's all about being able to visualize the problem, understanding conceptually what distance you're looking for, and then being able to match that on this diagram. Now I'm going to, go ahead and tell you <clears throat> anything related to this, 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 just ignore it for now. It'll make sense later, but for now, just ignore it. Okay? We will believe, we'll explain it. It'll, it'll become clear near the end of the semester. But anything related to the PNA or the X of P, the Y of P, ignore it. So if you ignore those, there's really only one dimension, and that's X bar. Okay? And ignore the shear center. This E sub naught, ignore that too. That's a, that's a whole other discussion. But basically, if you're bending a, a channel, that's where you put the load so that it doesn't twist. That's what the shear center is. Yes. You've already talked about it. Explain why we used the half of the WT. Okay. That's a great question. All right. So let me use this board over here. Well, first off, am I, did I answer this? And does anybody, did I answer this question for you? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions about this? Okay. Now, the question about the, the turning the W shape into an equivalent WT. Okay. Now, to be clear, that is only for one particular case. It's for when it's for when you have a wide flange and there's bolts through the flange. Okay? That's the only case that you do that for. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is go back to this scenario and see if I can visualize it, kind of like that. Now remember, this is in three dimensions, right? And so you're going to have like, you know, a bolt here, a bolt here, a bolt here. So, something like that, right? Okay. So let me see if I can draw this out. So what would this look like if I was looking at it on the side? Maybe I've got...
So there's my wide flange on the side, right? And so there's the flange just sticking out. And so I'm going to have like <coughs> bold, bold. So those are the, the those are these bolt holes just looking at it on the side. Does that make sense? Okay. And so likewise I'm gonna have something over here. So Okay. Now how is this gonna to connect to the members on the side? It's not like the channel where I've got the channel and I just have a plate on each end. For this, I gotta have, you know, I gotta have a plate up here, and I gotta have a plate down here, right? And I gotta have a plate right here, and I gotta have a plate right there, right? And so those bolts are going to go like that. So you, you sort of get what's going on here, right? So far so good? Okay, now, let's say for the sake of discussion that you were standing up here with me, okay? And here's the idea, right? Now I'm holding it on this end. You're holding it over here. Now I'm going to challenge you to do something. I want you to apply tension to the wide flange to the to the section, but I don't want you to touch the section at all. So how do you yank on this member without touching? Well, if I'm restraining this in, the way that you yank it is you grab a hold of these two plates, right? You grab these two plates, yank on it, they're bolted to the wide flange, that'll stretch the section out. Does that make sense? Okay, now think about that hip bone connected to the leg bone, right? So you are going to grab the plates, yank. Okay, you grab the plates and yank. The load goes from your hands to the plates, from the plates to the bolts, from the bolts to the wide plates, right? Make sense? Now, it takes a while for those stresses to propagate throughout the cross section, right? So the stress from this bolt here has to propagate through. The stress here has to propagate through. The stress here has to propagate through. Just like this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. Does that make sense? So, you're yanking like that, and those stresses, they sort of travel throughout the cross section. When you get out here, the stresses are pretty uniform. But over here, the stresses are all funky, and they're all weird. Okay? So when we're doing shear lag, because the stresses are all funky, we have to count for that discontinuity. That's what the shear lag factor is for. That's the whole reason we calculate U, is because the stresses are all weird. The way that we assume that, to keep it simple, is we say half the load goes this way and half the load goes that way. And so if I have this I shape, with the bolts like this, if I'm assuming half the load goes above and half the load goes below, I'm basically saying all we have to do is look at the tube shape. Does that make sense? So that's, that's why you do that, is because you're assuming that when you apply tension to a connection like that, that for the purposes of a shear lag consideration, you can consider just half of that connection because half the load is going up there. So when you do your connection eccentricity, you're saying connected face to this centroid, which is Y bar for AWT. Does that make sense? So if they're connected to the web, the bulk bolts are to the web of the, you just use the centroid of the, no, um, that's not what you would do. I know that's a good question, but I'm going to answer this question, 
But with the caveat, I'm not going to make you do this on the exam. Okay? Okay. But what you would do, what you would do, if the bolts are going through the web, you would cut that in half and say what's that central. I'm not making you do that, so don't worry about it, okay? Because you have to actually figure that out. Like, don't worry, I'm not going to make you do that. That's a conceptual question. How come, like, you determine your, like, fracture lines for, like, a web connection, for, like, a C or W shape? How come the flange, like, width doesn't affect that fracture line of your bolts? If that makes any sense. Hold on, hold on. Ask that again. Hold on. Let, let me... So if you have, like, a W shape that's folded with, through the flange, you get these, like, potential fracture lines depending on your bolt pattern, staggered or not. And then, but if it's attached on the web, you basically have those same potential uh, fracture paths. And I was just curious, like, okay, okay, flange, hold on. how can you flange with them like that? So, I'm going to take a wild guess and say you're talking about the last one on homework two? Yeah, like okay. C shape kind of. Yeah. Okay, so that, that problem looks, it might be a mirror image, and so forgive me. Sorry if that's a far-fetched question. But no, no, it, no, it's not. So that that was the member, maybe it was mirrored or something like that. And so there was this fracture and then that fracture and then that fracture like that. Okay. Ask your question again. I want to. I don't. Well, I, theoretically, I wouldn't think it would like fracture through the flange and straight path as well. So I was just wondering if there was like. <clears throat> I don't know. Okay. Let. That, that, okay. Let's talk about this. All right. Let's ignore the bolt holes. Let's ignore any of this. Ignore what's going on here. Okay. I want to keep this simple. <clears throat> Now, okay, let's yank on this. Okay, circular cross section, right? So if I samurai sword or lightsaber, like that, right? If I cut and I look, what do I see? Just a circle. Right? And so this, actually, let me draw this a little more accurately. <clears throat> okay. And so this has an area. We'll call this area one. With me? Now, you're suggesting, you're asking, well, what if it didn't fracture along a straight path? Right? Okay. So let's just take a very, very basic scenario. Okay. Let's take this problem, but let's, now let's look at it like this. Right? Okay, so this is not on a straight path, right? It doesn't matter whether or not it rotates this way or rotates that way. It's just not perpendicular, not normal to the load, right? Now, that area, would you agree, is a circle? Now think, I got a circular bar, right? But I'm Judy chopping it instead of Ninja chopping it, right? So when I do that, what does this look like? Well, if I were to imagine I have a you know wooden dowel and I cut it like that in a circular saw, and I look at the cut, it probably looks kind of something like that. Would that, would that. I mean, it's about the best I can do, but is that a fair statement? Okay. With me so far? Okay. Now, 
Let's say this is made of steel, so it has a yield stress of Fy, tensile stress of Fu. Let's say we're computing fracture capacities. So the P max across section 1 is Fu times the area of section 1. P max across section 2 is Fu times the area of section 2, right? With me so far? Now, it's, this is the same value. So let me ask you a question. If I'm yanking on this, which load am I going to hit first? One or two? One. Because this area is the smallest, right? Cutting perpendicularly yields the absolute smallest area possible. Okay? Any cut or any section where instead of I'm cutting like this, I'm cutting like that or cutting like that, results in a bigger area, which results in a bigger load. So your question about when you have a staggered path, like you're thinking it wouldn't fracture perpendicularly along the flange, yeah. well, well, think that out. For it to cut diagonally, it would have to rip through a larger area, and it wouldn't want to do that. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I see what I'm saying. And see, and that's like whenever we have a staggered connection, it's a little weird because we have more bolt holes, but we also have this because it's a larger area, right? So what we do is we subtract the number of bolt holes, but to account for this effect, we add stagger factors. Does that make sense? So that, that's sort of what that's doing, and that's why you're able to, you know, take these, these different, you know, net area paths and compare them apples to apples. But just ripping through the main body of the member it's only going to want to rip this way because that's the least amount of steel that it would rip through. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get that. Is that, is that that's a good question. Is everybody else okay with that? Yes, it's, it's just about what it wants to do. And what it's going to want to do is fail along the least path, the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance in this case is the path of the least area. So whenever you've got that channel or that wide flange and you cut it like that, I mean, think about it like this. Imagine taking an I-beam, cutting it like this, and cutting it like that, and taking the end and dipping it in ink and stamping it on a sheet of paper. I guarantee you the one that's the normal cut is going to leave a smaller mark on the paper. That's a great question. That's a great question. I like this stuff. Oh, there's got to be more. Can't let me off that easy. <clears throat> You look like you got a question. Cool. How come with like a concrete cylinder, it won't break right in the middle? It's kind of like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. So, what does how does that idea tie into? Oh, we're going to talk about that in concrete design uh, later on. Um, what's happening? So, what happens inside a cylinder is you basically have what's uh, what you're experiencing as shear failure. So, let me let me show you something. Now we're getting we're we're talking about concrete design. So, but but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Okay. Whenever you have, an, the easiest way to explain it is with like a concrete beam. So, so bear with me. So here's the support. Here's the load. Like that, right? Okay. So what you have here is a region of very, very high shear, right? Remember, if you have a beam with a distributed load on it, you have regions of very, very high shear, but then regions of very high moment. So the middle of the beam is wanting to bend a lot, but the, the supports, near the supports, they're wanting to shear, right? Now, I'm going to break it, uh, bring it back. Do you remember this thing in deformables called Moore Circle? You know how it was like, so for some people it's like, right? Because it's, it's a little bit of a space age concept, and I don't agree with that. But all Moore circle is, okay, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. All it is is a mathematical way of interpreting whether or not you judy chop through a section, karate chop, or ninja chop. That's all it is, okay? You like my, my. Now, don't go karate chopping while you're kung fu kicking. Go like that. There goes your leg. Everybody get the reference. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Now, without 
getting too much into the math. What happens when you have nothing but shear stress, you find that your worst case section cut is at 45 degrees. Okay. Now, when you look at your stress element in 45 degrees, what you have is you have equal and opposite stresses where these are in tension and these are in compression. What does concrete not like to do? Be in tension. tension. So whenever you look at shear cracks in reinforced concrete beams, they always go like that at 45 degrees. So to answer your question, it's because where concrete is weaker in tension than it is in compression, because the cylinder, I mean, it's not like it's, you know, 100 feet long, it's only this big, and it's not very homogeneous. I mean, you got gravel and sand and smell all, all over the place. It's figuring out the path of least resistance, and sometimes that's cracking this way. That would be the, the simplest answer I can provide. And, and it goes, it, I think the biggest point is that it's because concrete is not, it, it's not homogeneous. It's not like steel, where if I cut, it's all steel. Like, cut through a, a concrete element, you got gravel here, gravel here, and sand. It's very, it, it, it's very heterogeneous. It's mixed up all over the place. Okay, and that, so it's, it's not as simple to predict as steel. Steel's a much more simple material from a behavior standpoint. That's a great question. <clears throat> a great question. This is good stuff. We've still got plenty of time. How likely is a threaded rod workout problem? Yeah. <laughs> Potential. Oh, yeah. How big of a curveball are you planning on throwing at this? Right Me? Throw a curveball? Yeah. Would I ever do that to you? Almost every class, yeah. Okay. I'll never use it. I just want to know how big the ball is. <laughs> There'll be one. I'll go and tell you, but <clears throat> I mean, it's not going to be Im impossible. I threw a heck of a curveball on the first steel design exam I ever gave. It was over in 101 in the old building, and uh, I was outside of the classroom, and as the students were leaving, they were like, Dr. Mike, what the heck was that, man? <laughs> and then the average on the exam was like an 85. Like, Y'all were fine, you know. I promise it'll be okay. Yeah, that was a curveball. I remember that one. They, uh, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll give you like a, a, a B minus for effort on that one. <laughs> yeah, <I> mean, <laughs> that was messed up. I'll tell you. After the exam. I have a feeling after the exam you won't have to tell us. If that was the case, you would say, okay, we just got to find out who took steel design from Dr. Mike in 2015 and see if they get a copy of their exam. <clears throat> that wasn't a Chase and Barry's group, was it? No. No. Nice try. <laughs> All right. Chase and Barry never had me for steel. Barry had me for bridge and journey later. Nice try, though. <laughs> um, we got plenty of time. I mean, we've got 10 more minutes. I mean, there's plenty of time for more questions. Two bolts. So if it's so if you had you know 
bowl, 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 three separate stacker factors. I'm just as an example. <coughs> Any other questions? You feel better about the exam or worse or better? But again, what I would say is just, you know, study your homeworks, prepare your formula sheet, you know, go through the notes, you'll be fine. I mean, I, I, I promise. I, I don't, I mean, I'm going to throw a curveball on you, I'm not going to lie, but I don't think it's, um, I mean, y'all have had me before. You know how I do my exams. I don't think I, I, I prepare anything that's impossible. So I'm not going to come in as, I mean, have I ever come? I mean, y'all have. I, the average was a 30, you know. I don't think I've ever done that. So. It'll be a doable exam. It'll be challenging, but doable. <clears throat> Any other questions? You good? You good? You can't do it right now. <laughs> I don't have it ready right now. You good? You good? All right. So the real challenge for those of you in concrete design is are you going to be able to pay attention for the concrete design on Wednesday? We're still going in there. So. <laughs>